Chapter 6 Cornelius returned home via Moore's models. The daddy had, no doubt, through some oversight, neglected to mention the matter of his long overdue account with Mr Moore, and the tall boy was forced to pay this before the shopkeeper would part with the goods. Charge all future bills directly to me, Cornelius said with a smile. The Moore came over all giddy at this and had to have a sit down. Once back at Moby Dick Terrace, Cornelius explained matters to the parents, borrowed the book of ultimate truths, had his bags packed for him, and took his leave. He bade his farewells to tup at the wife's legs. His pleas to Mr. Cobold for an assistant, even one paid for at his own expense, had fallen upon deaf ears. Mr. Cobold was adamant. Cornelius must go it alone. And so it is farewell, I'm afraid, he told the short person. Send me postcard then. Tup raised his teacup in both hands, and if you could see your way clear to buy me one of those little Scottish drummer girl dolls in the transparent plastic cartons, <laughs> Cornelius put a thumb up, then you'd probably see your way clear to getting me a bottle of scotch instead. I'll buy you a case. My thanks, I'll see that you're all packed up. Tup indicated the suitcase and rucksack beneath the table. I'll have to start right away, catch a train tonight. So what's in the rucksack? Winter woolies, a thermos of coffee, and a pack of the daddy's ex-TA field rations. The parents would not let me leave home without them. Very wise, and you best go to the toilet before you leave. You don't want to get caught short. <laughs> Tup grinned foolishly. Too true. When Cornelius returned from the gents, Tup was no one to be seen. At precisely the stroke of six, the mighty Leviathan-class locomotive, gushing steam and panting dramatically, left King's Cross Station behind and set off for Scotland. In the first-class dining car, Cornelius Murphy spooned Brown Windsor into his mouth and leafed through the Book of Ultimate Truths. He folded back a page at random and read the chapter heading, Wonders of the Animal Kingdom, and what lay beneath it. Throughout history, many learned men have studied the animal kingdom and spoiled countless reams of perfectly good paper with their observations. Pliny the Elder was a great man for this kind of thing. In his Natural History, first published in AD 77, he devotes a chapter to the humble goldfish. Here are his seven wonderful varieties on the subject. The goldfish is the only creature which does not displace its own weight in water. In order to survive, the goldfish must consume at least four times its body weight every hour. Under a new moon, a goldfish always points due north. Marco Polo is known to have carried a number of goldfish with him in case his lodestone ever broke down H.R. In Upper Sumatra, goldfish are used as currency. In Egypt, goldfish skins are used as condoms. Powdered goldfish is a popular aphrodisiac. The goldfish is the rarely used 13th sign of the Dolyak. Well, we've certainly come a long way since Pliny's day. Goldfish skins are now in common use as condoms the world over. But do we really know any more about the animal kingdom now than Pliny thought he knew then? I wonder. Take, for example, the phenomenon of fish falls, rains of tiny fish cascading down on the planet. Observed by many, disbelieved by most, understood by none. And what about hedgehog falls? So much solid evidence and no research carried out whatsoever. Take a drive in the country during the hedgehog season and you will see the remains of thousands of them splattered across the roads and observe just how flat they are. They must have fallen from a very great height to end up like that. The popular explanation for these pitiful remains is that the hedgehogs have been run over by motor cars. Oh dear, oh dear. It is quite clear to me that the hedgehog, or hedge-hopping hog as it was originally known, is a dweller of the upper atmosphere. It feeds upon flying insects and the tiny fish that inhabit the aquasphere. The aquasphere, as all who have read my monograph know is flood. Where all that water actually came from will know is the mile-thick outer layer of water which prevents our atmosphere from drifting away into space. Hedgehogs, which fish in this region, float about up there, remaining aloft due to the inflated sacs of natural methane which surround their bodies. When they die, often due to punctures received during the rutting season, they deflate and plunge down to earth, exploding as they strike the tarmac. The fact that you never see a flat hedgehog upon a soft, grassy field bears this out and proves my point somewhat conclusively, I saw believe. Another case of popular explanation, falling well wide of the mark, is that of the so-called extinct woolly mammoth. 
During my travels across the Siberian steppe some years ago, I chanced upon a team of Russian paleontologists who were clearly in a state of heightened exuberance. Apparently an unseasonable deluge had washed away a section of riverbank, exposing the perfectly preserved carcass of a woolly mammoth. The beast was frozen in a running posture and looked as fresh as the proverbial daisy. The Russian greybeards were quite beside themselves with glee, considering this to be the find of the century. Somehow they had got it into their heads that the specimen was at least 15,000 years old. I introduced myself, and upon learning my identity, they naturally begged me to examine their treasure and offer an authoritative opinion. I was pleased to do so, having nothing else planned for the morning. I perused the beast and proclaimed that it was indeed a woolly mammoth of the genus Mammothus primigenius, and that it had been dead for at least half an hour. The woolly mammoth, I explained to them, is a burrowing animal, which lives exclusively beneath the ground and is very common in these parts. It tunnels with its enormous tusks and dies instantly upon exposure to sunlight. You have a nice fresh one here, I told them, and it would be a shame to waste it. Without further ado, I had my servants haul the carcass back to the village where I was staying and get the fire stalked up. The greybeards made quite unnecessary fuss about this, and I was forced to employ my stout stick. With typical bad greys, they did not attend the barbecue. Is Sir ready to order his main course now? Cornelius looked up from his reading to view the spiffingly clad dining car attendant. Yes, said he. We have fillet of goldfish, purged in white wine, chateau briand of hedgehog, garnished with tiny fish, or entrecot of woolly ma- I'll take a salad, please, said Cornelius Murphy. At seven-thirty of the following morning clock, the mighty leviathan gasped its way into Edinburgh Central without any fanfare whatsoever. Cornelius stuck his head out of the window of the first-class sleeping compartment and breathed in Scotland. His hair took to the forming of dreadlocks. It looked like another beautiful day out there. The tall boy washed, cleaned his teeth, fought bravely with his comb, and then dressed in a faded Hawaiian shirt and his summer suit. He considered leaving the rucksack on the train, but as it contained several of his favourite Fair Isle jumpers, and this was Bonnie Scotland after all, he thought better of it and shouldered the thing. Then, clutching the suitcase, he tottered down onto the platform. A stranger in a strange land, and all alone by the looks of it. His first thought was to phone his expenses to Arthur Corbold, his second to take breakfast. His first disappointment was a lack of a porter to carry his bags. His second came at the ticket booth, where there was no one for him to show his first-class ticket to. Cornelius dragged his suitcase across the deserted concourse of the Grand Victorian Station, Ahead, a kiosk, fashioned in the manner of a tartan fairground booth, offered up the tantalising fragrances of fried bacon and freshly brewed coffee. Cornelius found a spring creeping into his step. Behind the counter, a gaunt-looking woman in an apron was standing with her hands on her head. "'Good morning, madam.' Cornelius lowered his suitcase, took off his rucksack and climbed onto a stool before the counter. The gaunt woman did not return the merry smile he offered in greeting." We're closed, she announced in a frosty tone. Cornelius observed that a small blue vein, snaking down the bridge of her nose, reproduced the course of the Euphrates. No, you're not, said the undaunted lad. You're open. I'll take a coffee and a full breakfast, please. The coffee's off. No, it's not. It's bubbling away on the hob there. It's off. Might I just sample it? The coffee's off. Sling your hook. You didn't move your lips when you said that. Cornelius wondered whether he had stumbled into the rehearsal for some fringe event of the now legendary Edinburgh Festival. Uh, did you do that? he asked. I did it. A head rose from behind the counter. It was a perfectly spherical head, and it wore a tartan tam It also wore a youthful face, the greater part of which lurked behind the thick pebbled spectacles of the seriously myopic. Beneath a nubbin of a nose, a mouth, not unlike that of a goldfish, stuck out its bottom lip in a menacing manner. Cornelius worried most about the nose, how it could support the weight of the spectacles. Campbell, said Cornelius. I don't know you, do I? The young man squinted at Cornelius and then generally about the place. The tartan, on your term, that is a clan cloth of Callum the Great, dates back to the 14th century. Shove off, said the Campbell. I want my breakfast. Cornelius rubbed his hands together. Listen, friend, the Campbell produced a pistol and pointed it at the tall boy. Do you see this? Cornelius nodded. 
That's an OZ 9mm pistol, fully automatic, 25 round clip, detachable stock. And it's loaded by the Wii. Possibly with plasticine. It's an airfix kit. I've got one like it at home. The sight on the barrel is too long. I wrote airfix about that, but they never answered my letter. A look of horror appeared on the Campbell's clock face. He held the gun close to his spectacles and worried at the trigger. It came away in his hand and tinkled to the counter. Cornelius picked it up. I mentioned that too. Look out, he added, but he was not quick enough. The gaunt woman headbutted the Campbell and he vanished beneath the counter. His howls echoed around the empty station as she began kicking him. I'll wait until you're done then. Cornelius made himself comfy on the stool and sniffed at the coffee pot. And don't come back! The gaunt woman lifted a counterflap, swung open a section beneath it and hurled the Campbell across the concourse. He bowled over several times before rising in a confusion of camouflage, clutching his spectacles to his face and taking to his heels. The gaunt woman hurled his plastic pistol after him. A pox on all the bloody Campbells, she cried, echoing the sentiments of many a fine art lover at an Andy Warhol retrospective. So, what about you then? Breakfast for me, smiled Cornelius. Eggs if you have them. The gaunt woman turned away. And bacon. The gaunt woman glared around at him. And? And everything you've got, really. Everything I've got. Muttering beneath her breath, she set to the preparation of the tall boy's breakfast. Back in Morby Dick Terrace, the street's only telephone began to ring. The daddy swayed from the kitchen, teacup in hand, and picked up the receiver. After a few moments, a voice said, Hello, is there anybody there? It was the voice of the youth employment officer. What is it, Yarrow? The daddy raised his teacup to his lips. Cold again? He shook his head. Mr Murphy, I want to speak to your son. It's very urgent. My son is presently in Scotland. Your son is a very wicked boy, Mr Murphy. He has played me false. This letter... Letter? The daddy finished his tea. From your son, demanding money. Surely not. My son would never do a thing like that. He would, and he has. He claims to have found employment for himself. That doesn't sound very demanding to me. He claims that I employed him as an assistant in order to find him a real job. Which you did. But now he claims that as he has found work independently, I can no longer employ him in this capacity. Which you can't. So he's therefore claiming that, as I have no further work for him, then I must make him redundant. Which I suppose you must. But he wants redundancy money, a month's pay. Seems a reasonable enough request to me. The daddy held the receiver at arm's length to spare his ears the inevitable assault. Reasonable! screamed Mr Yarrow. Reasonable! It's outrageous! Well, technically speaking, the phone was back at Jack Murphy's ear. You are no longer in a position to provide him with employment, and of course you had no written contract. I can cite several legal precedents, industrial relations being something of a specialty with me. For instance, there was the case of John Vincent O'Malley versus Arthur Dovston, purveyor of steam velocipedes in the gentry. Dovston, bankrupt now, of course. It wasn't a particularly big case, but it attracted a lot of attention from local press. You know how they like crusading for the cause of the underdog. I won't have it, Mr Murphy. There was a slight pause. Bankrupt? Case? Press? Underdog? He continued in a lesser voice. You stand your corner, the daddy advised. Have your day in court. My day in court? I'll have to go now, said the daddy. I think the cat wants to be let out. He replaced the receiver and collapsed into fits of laughter. His wife appeared at the top of the stairs wearing a dressing gown of many colours. Who is that? she asked. Her husband did his best to sober up. <laughs> Mr Yarrow, he replied between convulsions. <laughs> Apparently Cornelius wrote to him demanding redundancy money. Nonsense, said the mother. My son would never do a thing like that. That's just what I said to Mr Yarrow. My son would never do a thing like that. The daddy returned to the kitchen and poured himself another cup of tea. That's why I did, he chuckled. Quite unaware that he had a month's redundancy money coming, Cornelius finished his breakfast. He passed a nice new five-pound note across the counter. First class, said he. Could I trouble you for a receipt? The gaunt woman did not reply. As there was still no sign of a porter, or anyone else for that matter, Cornelius shouldered his rucksack, took up his case and walked. He went in search of a taxi didn't find one though, but he did find the rank, and sitting on the ground with his back against the sign which told travellers which side they should be queuing on, he found the Campbell. The erstwhile bandido wore a bloody nose which he was dabbing at with an oversized tartan handkerchief. 
He gazed up at Cornelius through the unfractured lens of his spectacles. Cornelius wondered whether the festival might be staging a production of Lord of the Flies this year. Thanks a lot, said the Campbell. Cornelius shrugged. You started. I hope you didn't pay too much for the toy gun. The gaunt woman broke it. The bastards said it was a real one. They never let me join in their gang, no. Bastards. Cornelius had heard tell of bastards, and how, if you ever met any, you should be careful not to let them grind you down. He couldn't recall actually having met any himself as yet. A good many fools, certainly, but no real bastards. Of which bastards do you speak? He asked Sir Campbell. The wild warriors of West Lothian. They get all the best lasses and have adventures and stuff. I want you to join their gang. And you had to rob the kiosk, is that it? Rob the kiosk and then blow it up. Blow it up? With what? They gave me a hand grenade. You're certain it's a real hand grenade, not a cigarette lighter. The Campbell yanked a Mills bomb from a camouflage pocket and flung it up at Cornelius. The tall boy caught it. It was a cigarette lighter. He turned it to the field initiate without comment. A taxi was approaching. You're probably not really cut out for the life of brigandry and terrorism, said Cornelius kindly. Can I offer you a lift home? You wouldn't let me take your hostage by any chance, the Campbell asked hopefully. They might make do with that. I really don't have the time, I'm afraid. I have an appointment at one. Perhaps later, if I come back this way. It won't take long. An hour, maybe. Listen, I'd really appreciate it. They wouldn't actually want to keep you, of course, but it'd show them that I'm ambitious, enterprising, young and independently minded. I suppose it would. And do you sure that you want to join this gang? It's either that'll take the job the youth employment officer set up for me. And what is that? Carpet salesman, said the Campbell in a low, doomed tone. The taxi drove the Campbell and his hostage through the historic streets of Edinburgh, Cornelius enjoyed every moment of it. He kept an eye out for fierce-looking Highlanders with red beards, kilts and claymores, but he didn't see any. "'Where are all the sporrans and the dirks in the socks?' he asked the Campbell. "'And where's your ball of hat?' the Campbell replied, and the two sat a while in silence. "'You're on the corner, do you, Jimmy?' the taxi driver asked. "'Jimmy?' Cornelius turned to his kidnapper. The taxi driver knows you by name. "'All Scotsmen are called Jimmy.' The Campbell straightened his tongue. Everyone knows that. It's a tradition or an old charter or something. I thought all Scotsmen were called Jock. Look oh, away, that's Irishman. Irishmen are called Mick and Londoners are called John. Jock, said the taxi driver. Londoners are called Jack, or at least Jack London was. He wrote Call of the Wild. Wild was called Oscar, said the Campbell. Jack Nicholson won an Oscar, said the taxi driver. And he's called Jack, but I think he's American. One of the rest of them are called Bastards, said the Campbell. Well... You'll earn something new every day. That'll be two pounds, please, Cornelius. Cornelius fished out the money. Could I have a receipt for that? He asked. And I never told you my name. The taxi driver scribbled something indecipherable upon the back of a woodbine packet and handed it to Cornelius. Only winding you up. I saw your picture in the paper. My what? The taxi driver held up a copy of the day's Edinburgh Mercury. Its banner headline read, Epic Traveller Foil Station Kiosk Heist. Beneath this was a photograph of the hero taking breakfast. Cornelius snatched the newspaper and gawped at it in disbelief. Come on, said Jim Campbell. I thought you were in a hurry.